who invented the X-ray. German physicist Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, 1845-1923, discovered X-rays in 1895 but did not understand. At first what they were which is how they got their name, in science and math, X refers to an unknown. By the end of the decade, hospitals had put X-rays to use, taking pictures. Called radiographs, of bones and internal organs and tissues to help diagnose illnesses and injuries. Using the new technology, doctors could see the insides of a patient. In 1901 Röntgen received the first Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of a shortwave ray. How long have humans been producing art? The first true art was originated by Homo sapiens sapiens. Called man the double wise, in Europe about 35,000 years ago, during the Stone Age. Man the double wise painted his own handprints, warrior images, and animals. Including bison, horses, and reindeer, on the walls and ceilings of uninhabited caves. In France and Spain between 35,000 BC and 8,000 BC. He used red, black, and yellow paints which were made by mixing powdered earth and rock pigments with water. Among the most famous paintings are those in the caves at Lascaux, in Dordogne, France, Nio, Erige, France, Peck Merle, Lot, France, Gajola, Castellan, Spain, and Altamira, Cantabria, Spain. These early modern humans who, if dressed in contemporary clothing, would be nearly indistinguishable from anyone on a modern city street also decorated tools and created lifelike sculptures of animals and women. European man of this period, who had a fully developed human brain, is also referred to as Cro-Magnon Man for a shallow rock shelter near Laisies in the Dordogne region of southwestern France. Where, in 1868, skeletal remains of the tall, erect walking species were found. What were the fireside chats? They were radio broadcasts of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's, 1882-1945, Messages to the American People. FDR began making the informal addresses on March 12, 1933. During the long and dark days of the Great Depression. In his efforts to reassure the nation. FDR urged listeners to have faith in the banks and to support his New Deal measures. Sometimes beginning his talks with my friends, the radio broadcasts were enormously successful and attracted more listeners than even the most popular broadcasts during this golden age of radio. FDR continued his fireside chats into the 1940s, as Americans turned their attention to the war effort. Were the Vikings the first Europeans to reach North America?
it is believed that the seafaring Norsemen, who are alternately called the Vikings, were in fact the first Europeans to see the Western Hemisphere, North and South America and the surrounding waters. Norwegian-born Leif Eriksson, C970 C1020 is generally credited with having been the first European to set foot on North American soil. Ericsson was the son of navigator Eric the Red, who founded a Norse settlement in Greenland and moved his family there in 985 or 986. About that same time another Norseman, Bjarni Herjolfsson, who was driven off course on his way from Iceland to Greenland, became the first European to sight North America, but he did not go ashore. It is believed that Ericsson decided he would follow up on Herjolfsson's discovery. About 1001 Ericsson set out from Greenland with a crew of 35 men and probably landed on the southern end of Baffin Island, due north of the province of Quebec. The expedition likely made it to Labrador, Newfoundland, on the northeastern North American mainland, and later landed on the coast of what is today Nova Scotia or Newfoundland. Canada, this landfall may have been at Lance Auxiliary Meadows, on Newfoundland Island. Ericsson and his crew spent the winter of 1001-02 at a place he called Vinland. Which was described as well wooded and produced fruit, especially grapes. He returned to Greenland in the spring of 1002. The first authenticated European. Landing in North America was in 1500 when Portuguese navigator Gaspar de Corte Real. C1450 C1501, explored the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland. A year later, he made a second trip to North America but never returned home. In 1502 his brother Miguel went out in search of him, neither returned. Was the Titanic the most disastrous shipwreck of all time? Though it is certainly the most famous, it is not the most disastrous. According to shipping registries, three wrecks were worse than the Titanic. In April 1865 the sidewheel steamboat Sultana exploded on the Mississippi River, killing 1,653 of the estimated 2,300 people on board. The packet steamboat had routinely carried passengers and cargo between St. Louis and New Orleans. In 1917 the Mont Blanc exploded in the harbor at Halifax. Nova Scotia, claiming 1,635 lives and severely injuring more than 1,000. The ship, which was a French munitions carrier. World War I was raging at the time, was struck by a Norwegian relief ship, the Imo. The Mont Blanc was laden with thousands of tons of TNT, acid, and other explosives which were ignited in the collision. The explosion was so terrific that it laid waste to much of Halifax and generated a tsunami that swept through the city. Most recently, in 1987, the Dona Paz collided with another ship off the Philippines, 1,840 died.
When were the first Olympic Games? The Olympics date to about 900 B.C. when, in ancient Greece, tens of thousands of sandal-wearing spectators descended on Olympia to cheer the runners, wrestlers, and bare-skinned boxers competing there. The Games at Olympia were one of four athletic festivals in Greece, the others being the Isthmian Games at Corinth. The Nemean Games, and the Pythian Games at Delphi, all of which alternated to form the Periodos. Or circuits, which guaranteed sports fans the opportunity to attend an athletic festival every year. Winning was everything then, athletes were required to register in order to compete. And rumors of Herculean opponents sometimes prompted competitors to withdraw. Victors were awarded crowns of olive leaves, and the second and third place finishers returned home undecorated. The modern Olympic Games, begun by diminutive Frenchman Baron Pierre de Coubertin, 1862 to 1937, possess a decidedly different spirit than did their ancient counterpart, where the only rules were that participants were not allowed to gouge. Bite, put a knee to the groin, strangle, or throw sand at their opponent. The modern Olympic Games, publicly proposed by Coubertin on November 25, 1892, in Paris, and first held in Athens, Greece, in 1896, are based on their initiator's vision of the Olympic competition as an occasion to promote peace, harmony, and internationalism. In April 1896 some 40,000 spectators pressed into the Panathenaean Stadium, which had been constructed on the site of an ancient stadium in Athens, to witness the athletic feats of the first modern Olympic heroes. Thirteen nations participated, only male athletes, just more than 300 of them competed, and Greece received the most medals, 47. The second Olympic Games were held in 1900 in Paris. How old is the concept of public health? Public health is an old concept, dating back to when people first began living in communities. Through the ages, governments have shown varying degrees of concern for the public health. The ancients Greeks, and the Romans after them, tried to ensure the health of their citizens. By providing a supply of clean water, via aqueducts and pipelines, managing the disposal of waste and working to control disease by hiring public physicians to treat the sick. These measures may have helped prevent the spread of certain diseases, but epidemics still occurred. After the fall of the Roman Empire, c. 476, Europe's civilizations largely ignored matters of public health. Once disease was introduced to a community, it would spread quickly. Epidemics of leprosy, the plague, cholera, and yellow fever ensued. During the late 1800s European governments began turning their attention. To matters of public health in an effort to control the spread of disease. In the United States, the public health became an official concern when in 
1,866 a cholera epidemic struck the nation for the 18th consecutive year. It was part of a worldwide epidemic that persisted for 12 years. Though governments set up health facilities, including laboratories for the study of infectious disease. By 1893 another cholera pandemic, widespread epidemic, began. During the 20th century, the measures taken by national governments to safeguard their citizens from health risks have been strengthened by the establishment of regional and local laboratories. Public education programs, and the research conducted at universities and other institutions. These combined efforts have made outbreaks of diseases such as diphtheria, dysentery, typhoid fever, and scarlet fever increasingly less common in developed nations. In developing nations, public health officials continue working with international agencies, such as the World Health Organization and other United Nations agencies, to reduce instances and the spread of infectious disease. Who started the Boston Tea Party? Many believe that on December 13, 1773, it was Patriot Samuel Adams, 1722-1803, who gave the signal to the men, who may have numbered more than 100 and were dressed as Indians, to board the ships in Boston Harbor and dump the tea overboard. Whether or not it was Adams who started the tea party. About this there can be no doubt, he was most certainly a leader in the agitation that led up to the event. The show of resistance was in response to the recent passage by the British Parliament of the Tea Act, which allowed the British-owned East India Company to dump tea on the American colonies at a low price and also required that the colonists pay a duty for said tea. Colonists feared the act would put local merchants out of business and that if they conceded to pay the duty to the British, they would soon be required to pay other taxes as well. Once the ships carrying the tea had arrived in Boston Harbor, the colonists tried to have them sent back to England. But when Governor Thomas Hutchinson, 1711 to 1780 of Massachusetts refused to order the return of the ships. Patriots organized their show of resistance, which came to be known as the Boston Tea Party. How is the current era characterized? Ask the question of most any observer. And the answer would include catchphrases like global marketplace, global village, or globalization. Modern communications and transportation connect people as never before businesses enjoy. Broader markets for their goods and services, manufacturing facilities, and jobs are located far from the offices of the companies that market them, and people of many nationalities, races, and religions have more and more contact with one another every day, for business and pleasure. Some observers worry that this contact will blur rich cultural differences. Diluting diversity, others say that globalization will bring tolerance and increase understanding.
whatever the case, we are living our lives on a global stage. The things we buy and use are as likely to carry made in China or made in Mexico labels as they are any other. People continents away talk to each other not just over the telephone, but via cell phones. Instant messages, email, and internet chat rooms, we have an international forum the internet for buying. Selling, and publishing, and we can get almost anywhere in the world with all due haste. Everything travels faster today, including ideas. The upsides are many. Modern communications and transportation made it possible, for example. For the world to mobilize aid to victims of the Southeast Asian tsunami of December 2004. But there are downsides as well. Critics say globalization is fueling the exploitation of workers in developing nations. Contributing to a modern slave trade, rapidly depleting resources, and wiping out environmental diversity. These are some of the reasons protesters have demonstrated outside meetings of the World Trade Organization. Why some people opposed the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and oppose the pending CAFTA, Central American Free Trade Agreement. And why many people dislike that American popular culture is marketed around the world. The problem could be distilled to this, diversity versus homogeneity. And the resulting culture clashes are not restricted to the realm of scholarly thought. They are making headline news. The enemy is no longer the strong-armed, nuclear-fortified, absolutist government of the Cold War era. Though, as of mid-2005, North Korea remained a serious concern, the enemy. As the U.S. State Department reminds us, is any group of individuals with extreme views. Who invented jazz? Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton, 1885 to 1941, a New Orleans pianist, claimed credit for having invented jazz. And to some degree, it was fair of him to think so after all, his recordings with the group The Red Hot Peppers. 1926 to 30 are among the earliest examples of disciplined jazz ensemble work. But in truth, the evolution of jazz from ragtime and blues was something that many musicians in several cities took part in. Most regard Morton as one of the founders of jazz, the other founders include Benny Moton. 1894-1935, U.B. Blake, 1883-1983, Duke Ellington, 1899-1974, and Thomas Fats Waller, 1904-1943. Some would go back even farther to trace the roots of jazz, from 1899-1914 Scott Joplin. 1868-1917, popularized ragtime, which was based on African folk music. Even astute music critics may not be able to draw a clear-cut distinction between ragtime and early jazz. Both musical forms rely on syncopation, the stressing of the weak beats. And either style can be applied to an existing melody and transform it. The definitions and boundaries of the two terms have always been subject to debate. 
which is further complicated by the fact that some musicians of the time considered ragtime to be more or less a synonym for early jazz. But there are important, albeit not strict, differences between the two genres as well. Rags were composed and written down in the European style of notation, while early jazz was learned by ear. Players would simply show one another how a song went by playing it. Jazz encourages and expects improvisation, whereas ragtime, for the most part, did not. And the basic rhythms are also markedly different, with jazz having a swing or hot rhythm that ragtime does not. Whatever its origins, jazz became part of the musical mainstream by the 1930s and influenced other musical genres as well including classical. American composer George Gershwin, 1898-1937 was both a songwriter and composer of rags as well as a composer of symphonic works. Many of his works, including Rhapsody in Blue, 1924, and his piano preludes, contain ragtime and jazz elements. Perhaps more than any other composer and musician, Miles Davis. 1926 to 1991, expanded the genre, through decades of prolific work. Davis constantly pushed the boundaries of what defines jazz and in so doing set standards for other musicians. What was the goal of the Lewis and Clark expedition? The expedition, which began in 1804 and took more than two years to complete, had three purposes. To chart a route that would be part of a passage between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. To trace the boundaries of the territory obtained in the Louisiana Purchase, and to lay claim to the Oregon Territory. Thomas Jefferson 1743 to 1826, was President of the United States at the time. And he believed that a route could be found between St. Louis and the West Coast. As early as 1801, Jefferson had conceived of the idea that the Missouri and Columbia rivers might be followed west, leading to the Pacific. The journey would also be a reconnaissance mission. Information would be collected about the vast region and communications would be set up with its inhabitants. On April 30, 1803, the United States bought the Louisiana Territory from France. The purchase extended from the Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west and from the Gulf of Mexico in the south to British America, Canada, in the north. Jefferson soon picked his private secretary. Virginia-born Meriwether Lewis, 1774-1809, to lead the westward expedition. Lewis then chose as his co-leader William Clark, 1770-1838, who as a lieutenant in the U.S. Army, had served General Anthony Wayne on the frontier, 1792-96. Beginning in the summer of 1803, Lewis and Clark undertook the necessary preparations for the overland journey. These included studying the classification of plants and animals. 
Learning how to determine geographical position by observing the stars. And recruiting qualified men, mostly hunters and soldiers, for the expedition. On May 14, 1804, the Lewis and Clark expedition left St. Lewis and headed up the Missouri River to its source. They then crossed the Great Divide and followed the Columbia River to its mouth, in present-day Oregon. At the Pacific Ocean, where they arrived in November 1805 one and a half years after they had set out. They arrived back in St. Louis on September 23, 1806, having gathered valuable information on natural features of the country including its flora, fauna, and the Indian tribes who lived there. The expedition had been helped by the addition, in what is now North Dakota, of a Shoshone Indian woman named Sacagawea, c. 1786-1812. Lewis and Clark had hired her husband. French-Canadian trader to St. Charbonneau, as an interpreter during the winter of 1804-05. Lewis and Clark thought that Sacagawea would be able to help them communicate with the Shoshone living in the Rocky Mountains, which she later did, her brother was their chief. After the expedition, Lewis was made governor of Louisiana Territory. A post he served from 1807 to 1809. Clark resigned from the army in 1807 and became brigadier. General of the militia and superintendent of Indian affairs for Louisiana Territory. In 1813 he became governor of the Missouri Territory, the Louisiana Territory less the state of Louisiana which was organized as a state admitted into the Union in 1812, a post he held until 1821. Who invented the telegraph? Though the invention came as the result of several decades of research by many people, Samuel F. B. Morse, 1791-1872, is credited with making the first practical telegraph. The first instrument that could send messages across wires via electricity, in 1837. Morse was a portrait painter in Boston when he became interested in magnetic telegraphy in about 1832, with technical assistance from chemistry professor Leonard Gale. 1800 to 1883, and financial support from Alfred Vail, 1807 to 1859, Morse conducted further experiments. He also developed Morse code, a system of variously arranged dots and dashes which can be used to transmit messages. For example, the most frequently used letter of the alphabet is E, which is rendered in Morse code by using one dot. The less frequently used Z is rendered by two dashes followed by two dots. By 1837 Morse had demonstrated the telegraph to the public in New York, Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. He received a patent for his invention in the United States in 1840. In 1843 his invention got a boost when the U.S. Congress approved an experimental line to be built between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland. The following year, on May 24, 1844, 
Morse sent his first message across that line, What hath God wrought? Vale was on the receiving end of the wire. By 1861 most major U.S. cities were linked by telegraph wires. The first successful transatlantic cables were laid in 1866. Morse code transmissions Called telegraphs when transmitted via above-ground wires and cablegrams, or cables, when transmitted via underwater cables. Were translated by operators or mechanical printers on both the sending and receiving ends of the message. The introduction of the telegraph marked the beginning of modern communications. When the first transcontinental telegraph line in the United States was completed on October 24, 1861, it eliminated the need for the Pony Express, which had briefly enjoyed the status of the fastest way to transmit a message about eight days from St. Louis, Missouri, to Sacramento, California. A distance that could be bridged by telegraph lines within minutes. The telegraph became the chief means of long distance communication. The telephone, invented 1875, which allows voice transmission over electrical wires, gradually replaced the telegraph. But for many decades the two technologies were both in use. What was the Warsaw Pact? The Warsaw Pact was the Eastern Bloc country's answer to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Seeing the Western nations form a strong alliance, in May 1955 the Soviet Union and its allies met in Warsaw, Poland, where they signed a treaty agreeing that they, too, would mutually defend one another. The eight member nations were Albania, which withdrew in 1968, Bulgaria. Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and the Soviet Union. The Warsaw Pact was headquartered in Moscow and, in addition to discouraging attacks from Western Bloc-NATO countries, the organization also sought to quell any democratic uprisings in Warsaw Pact nations. But in 1990 the pact and the Soviet Union's control of it weakened. As democracy movements in member nations could not be put down. As the former Eastern Bloc countries underwent relatively peaceful revolutions. Warsaw Pact members began announcing their intentions to withdraw from the organization. East Germany withdrew when it was reunified with West Germany. And the Restore Germany joined NATO, in 1990. The Warsaw Pact was dissolved by the remaining member nations in 1991. If the Roman Empire was so powerful, how could it have fallen? One could argue that the Roman Empire collapsed under its own weight. It had become too vast to be effectively controlled by any one ruler. By the close of the Punic Wars in 146 BC, Greece, Macedonia, and the Mediterranean coasts of Spain and Africa had been brought under Roman control. Within a century, Rome again began to expand overseas. 
under the Roman general Pompey, 106-48 BC. Eastern Asia Minor, Syria, and Judea, Palestine, were conquered. Next, Gaul was conquered by Pompey's rival, Julius Caesar, 100-44 BC. Adding the territory west of Europe's Rhine River to the Roman world. In 31 BC, in the Battle of Actium, Octavian. 63b.ca.d.14, Julius Caesar's adopted son and heir, defeated the forces of Mark Antony, c. 83-30 BC. And Cleopatra, 69-30 BC, Queen of Egypt, and in 30 BC Egypt became a Roman province. In 27 BC Octavian became the first Roman emperor and was known as Augustus, meaning exalted. Though Octavian's rule marked the beginning of the long period of stability called the Pax Romana. The Roman Empire had become so large stretching across Europe and parts of Africa and the Middle East that only a strong, central authority could govern it. During the 200 years of the Pax Romana, Rome's emperors gradually grew more powerful. To the point that after death an emperor was worshipped by the people. But soon there were threats to this central control, not the least of which was the spread of Christianity. As well as invasions from the Germanic Goths and the Persians. Theodosius I, 379-395, was the last emperor to rule the entire Roman Empire. When he died in AD 395, the empire was split into the West Roman Empire and the East Roman Empire. Setting the stage for the decline of the Romans. The West Roman Empire came under a series of attacks by various Germanic tribes including the Vandals and the Visigoths, the western division of the Goths, who invaded Spain, Gaul, in Western Europe, and Northern Africa. These assaults eventually led to the disintegration of the West Roman Empire by 476. The East Roman Empire remained more or less intact, but it became known as the Byzantine Empire and was predominantly a Greek-oriented culture from 476 until 1453, when it fell to the Turks. Were the Spaniards the first Europeans to reach North America after the Vikings? No, that distinction goes to explorer John Cabot, c. 1451 to 1498, who in 1497 sailed westward from Bristol, England, in search of a trade route to the east. Cabot's story began in 1493 when Christopher Columbus, 1451 to 1506 returned to Spain from his New World voyage, claiming to have reached Asia. From the accounts of the trip, Cabot, who was himself a navigator, believed it was unlikely that Columbus had traveled that far. He did, however, believe it was possible, as did subsequent explorers. To find a route a northwest passage that ran north of the land mass Columbus had discovered, and by which Asia could be reached. In 1495 the Italian Cabot, born Giovanni Caboto, took his family to England, and the following year. In March, 
appealed to King Henry VII, 1457-1509, for his endorsement in pursuing the plan. For his part, the king, who was well aware of the claims made by the Spanish and Portuguese who had sponsored their own explorations, was eager to find new lands to rule. And so he granted a patent, authorizing Cabot's expedition. Later that year, 1496, Cabot set sail. But problems on board the ship and foul weather forced him to turn back. The following spring, on May 20, 1497, he sailed again, in a small ship that had been christened Matthew. The crew of 20 included his son, Sebastian. On June 24, they sighted land and Cabot went ashore. While he saw signs of human habitation, he encountered no one. From reports of the trip, scholars believe Cabot had reached the coasts of present-day Maine. Nova Scotia, and probably Newfoundland. He then sailed home, returning to England on August 6. He reported to the king six days later and was given a reward. As well as authorization for a more sizable expedition which he undertook in May 1498. This time Cabot set sail with five ships in his command. But the expedition was not heard from again. What is the Doomsday Clock? The clock represents the threat of nuclear annihilation. It was created by the board of directors of Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and first appeared on the cover of that magazine in 1947 two years after the United States had used two nuclear weapons against Japan. At Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to end World War II, 1939 to 45 The atomic scientists developed the idea in order to illustrate the threat of total destruction posed by nuclear weapons On the clock midnight is the time of destruction When the clock first appeared the scientists had set the time at 7 minutes before midnight in the decades since, the clock had been adjusted based on the proliferation of or agreements to limit nuclear weapons. The closest it ever came to doomsday was two minutes until midnight. This was in 1953, shortly after the United States and the Soviet Union each tested hydrogen bombs. The farthest the minute hand has ever been from striking the hour of midnight was in 1991, when the United States and the Soviet Union signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Start, and announced cuts in nuclear weapons. The scientists moved the clock to read 17 minutes until midnight. In the late 1990s the clock read 14 minutes to midnight. But the 1998 testing of nuclear weapons in Pakistan and India, neighboring countries long at odds with each other, resulted in the clock being forwarded to 9 minutes before midnight. In 2002 the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists informed the world that the clock had been adjusted to seven minutes to midnight, saying that not only had little progress been made on global nuclear disarmament, 
but the United States had rejected a series of arms control treaties and announced that it would withdraw from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Further, terrorists sought to acquire and use nuclear and biological weapons. All of this added up to a greater threat of nuclear annihilation. What was Teapot Dome? Teapot Dome was a notorious political scandal that was on a level with Watergate, 1972. While the early 1920s abuses of power affected President Warren G. Harding, 1865-1923, it was not Harding who was implicated in the crimes. Albert Bacon Fall, 1861-1944, Harding Secretary of the Interior Secretly transferred government oil lands at Elk Hills, California, and Teapot Dome Wyoming, to private use and he did so without a formal bidding process. Fall leased the Elk Hills Naval Oil Reserves to American businessman Edward L. Doheny 1856 to 1935 in exchange for an interest-free loan of $100,000. Fall made a similar arrangement with another businessman, Harry F. Sinclair, 1876 to 1956 of Sinclair Oil Corporation leasing the teapot. Dome reserves in exchange for $300,000 in cash, bonds, and livestock. The scandal was revealed in 1922. And committees of the U.S. Senate and a special commission spent the next six years sorting it all out. By the time the hearings and investigations were concluded in 1928, Harding had died. Fall had resigned from office and taken a job working for Sinclair, all three players Doheny, Sinclair. And Fall had faced charges, and the government had successfully sued the oil companies for the return of the lands. The punishments were light considering the serious nature of the charges, Fall was convicted of accepting a bribe. Find $100,000 and sentenced to a year in prison. While Doheny and Sinclair were both indicted but later acquitted of the charges against them, which included conspiracy and bribery. When was the Red Cross founded? The Red Cross was founded in Switzerland in October 1863 when the delegates from 16 nations met in Geneva to discuss establishing in all civilized countries permanent societies of volunteers who in time of war would give help to the wounded without regard for nationality. The idea had been described in a pamphlet published in 1862 by Swiss philanthropist Jean Henry Dunat, 1828-1910. In 1859 Dunat was in Italy when French and Italian troops under Napoleon III fought. Austrians under Emperor Francis Joseph in an indecisive battle in Lombardy, northern Italy. At Solferino, Dunat observed the suffering of the wounded and immediately organized a group of volunteers to help them. At the Geneva Conference in 1863, the delegates decided the organization's symbol and name. 
The name of the organization comes from its flag showing a red cross on a white. Background The inverse of the flag of Switzerland, where the organization was founded. The following August, 1864, European delegates met again. This time they were joined by two American observers. The meeting gave rise to the first Geneva Convention, which determined the protection of sick and wounded soldiers. And of medical personnel and facilities during wartime. The Red Cross was adopted as a symbol for neutral aid. In Muslim countries the organization is known as the Red Crescent. How did the earliest peoples arrive in North America? Long before the arrival of the Europeans in the Western Hemisphere in the late 1400s and early 1500s, Asian peoples are believed to have migrated over Beringia, a land bridge that is thought to have existed over the Bering Strait. The waterway that separates Asia, Russia, from North America, Alaska. Scholars believe that during the late Ice Age, known as the Pleistocene Glacial Epoch, which ended about 10,000 BC, a natural bridge was formed across the strait either by ice or by dropping sea levels that exposed land masses. Asian peoples, who were hunters, are believed to have migrated over Beringia as they pursued large game. Arriving in North America as early as 50,000 BC. These people, called Paleo Indians, were the first inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere. After their arrival, they spread out across North and South America. The many American Indian groups that were encountered by the Europeans. Upon their arrival were descendants of the migratory Paleo Indians. Who wrote the first computer program? The first functional computer program was written by Grace Murray Hopper. 1906-1992, an admiral of the U.S. Navy. She wrote a program for the Mark I computer. Developed in 1944, the first fully automatic calculator. During the 1950s Hopper directed the work that developed one of the most widely Used computer programming languages, COBOL, common business oriented language. She is also credited with coining the slang term bug to refer to computer program errors. The story goes that her machine had broken down. And when she looked into the problem, she discovered a dead moth in the computer. As she removed it, she reportedly announced that she was debugging the machine. Hopper served the U.S. Navy for 43 years. From 1943 to 1986, and retired as its most senior officer. She was also a professor at Vassar College and a programmer for the Sperry Rand. Corporation from 1959 to 1971. She is one of the pioneers of computer science. The very first computer program written, though never used, was also by a woman. The English Baroness Augusta Ada Byron, the poet Lord Byron's daughter, 
born 1815, wrote it for Charles Babbage's analytical engine. Which was never completed, and so the program was not tested. Why was the invention of barbed wire important to Western development? Barbed wire was commercially developed in 1874 by American inventor Joseph Glidden, 1813-1906. Consisting of steel wires that are twisted together to make sharp points resembling thorns. The material was quickly implemented in the West to construct fences. With trees scarce on the Great Plains, farmers had lacked the materials to erect wooden fences. Instead they resorted to planting prickly shrubs as a way of defining their lands and confining livestock. However, this method was not always effective. With the advent of barbed wire, farmers were able to fence in their acreage. Cattle owners became angered by small farmers who put up barbed wire. They had previously allowed livestock to roam the open plain. Fearing depletion of grazing lands, Ranchers also began using barbed wire to fence tracts. Whether or not they could claim legal title to them. Disputes arose between ranchers and between ranchers and farmers. In 1885 President Grover Cleveland, 1837-1908, brought an end to illegal fencing. Ordering officials to remove barbed wire from public lands and Indian reservations. Legal use of the material to define land claim boundaries brought the demise. Of the open range and helped speed agricultural development of the prairie. What is the plague? The plague is a general term that refers to any contagious epidemic disease. But usually refers specifically to bubonic plague, which gets its name from the swelling of the lymph nodes, or buboes. A bubonic plague epidemic spread throughout Europe and Asia in the middle of the 14th century. Killing as much as 75% of the population in 20 years, that epidemic came to be known as the Black Death. An acute infectious disease. The bubonic plague is carried to humans by fleas that have bitten infected rats and other rodents. Human symptoms include high fever, chills, swelling of the lymph nodes, and hemorrhages. Once the bacteria spreads to the lungs, it is quickly fatal. This form of the disease is called pneumonic plague. And can be transmitted from person to person via droplets. Improved sanitation, chiefly in developed nations, has reduced the occurrence of the disease. Bubonic plague still occurs, but the development of antibiotics. In the 20th century has greatly reduced the mortality rate. What led to the decline of communism in Eastern Europe? Anti-communist sentiment among Eastern Europeans was bolstered by 
The Actions and Policies of Soviet Leader Mikhail Gorbachev, 1931 When Gorbachev took office in 1985, the Soviet economy was in decline. In order to reverse the trend, he advocated dramatic reforms to move the economy away from the government-controlled communist system and toward a decentralized system, similar to those of Western democracies. Gorbachev's efforts to modernize the Soviet Union were not limited to the economy. He further proposed a reduction in the power of the Communist Party which had controlled the country since 1917. Gorbachev's programs for reform were termed perestroika, meaning restructuring. In the meantime, Gorbachev opened up relations with the West, which included visits with U.S. President Ronald Reagan. 1911-2004, who strongly supported the Soviet leaders' programs. Gorbachev referred to his policy of openness as glasnost. Both Russian terms quickly caught on around the world. While the economic reforms produced a slow and painful change for the Soviet people and Gorbachev had many detractors, including government officials. He also had many supporters both inside and outside the Soviet Union. People in other Eastern European countries watched with interest the Soviet move toward a more democratic system. Strikes in Poland had begun as early as 1980, where workers formed a free labor union called Solidarity. But the following year, the communist leaders of the Soviet Union pressured the Polish government to put an end to the movement which it did. After Gorbachev became head of the Soviet Union and initiated sweeping changes, the reform movements in other countries soon realized that the Soviets under Gorbachev would no longer take hard-handed tactics toward anti-communist efforts in other countries. In 1989 the Polish government ceased to prohibit solidarity, and the Communist Party there lost influence. The same was true in Hungary, East Germany, and Czechoslovakia. By the end of the decade, most of the Eastern European Communist governments were overthrown in favor of democratic-oriented governments. The transition was effected differently in each country. The overthrow in Czechoslovakia was so peaceful that it was called the Velvet Revolution, while in Romania. A bloody revolt ensued, and hardline communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, 1918-1989, was executed. In 1990 multi-party elections were held in Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, East Germany, and Bulgaria. The non-communist party that was put in power in East Germany agreed to unification with West Germany. Again creating one Germany on October 3. 1990 that same year Gorbachev received the Nobel Peace Prize for his contributions to world peace. Why were Matisse's paintings considered so shocking when they were debuted? Even if they seem commonplace to art today, the color and style of the paintings. Of French expressionist Henri Matisse, 1869-1954, were revolutionary in their day. In 1905 Matisse, along with several other artists, 
exhibited works at Paris's Salon d'Automne. The wildly colorful paintings on display there are said to have prompted an art critic to exclaim that they were fauve, or wild beasts. The name stuck, Matisse and his contemporaries who were using brilliant colors in an arbitrary fashion became known as the fauve. His famous work Madame Matisse, or Green Stripe, 1905, showed his wife with blue hair and a green stripe. Running down the middle of her face, which was colored pink on one side of her nose and yellow on the other. Matisse was at the forefront of a movement that was building new artistic values. The Fauve were not using color in a scientific manner, as George Seurat had done. Nor were they using it in the nondescriptive manner of Paul Gauguin, 1848-1903, and Vincent van Gogh, 1853-1890. The Fauve were developing the concept of abstraction. Throughout his career, Matisse continued to experiment with various art forms painting, paper cutouts, and sculptures. All of his works indicate a progressive elimination of detail and simplification of line and color. So influential was his style on modern art that some 70 years later one art critic commented that it was as if Matisse belonged to a later generation and a different world. Was the Madrid commuter train bombing an act of terrorism? Spanish officials concluded that the March 11, 2004, bombing of packed commuter trains in Madrid was an act of terrorism, likely motivated by Spain's arrest of dozens of Al-Qaeda suspects after the September 11, 2001, attacks on the United States. At least three of those arrested in Spain were charged with helping organize the 9-11 attacks. On March 11, 2004, ten backpacks loaded with dynamite exploded on four trains at the height of morning rush hour. Killing 191 people and injuring 1,800. In the investigation that followed, Officials uncovered other terrorist plots, including suicide bombings and assassinations aimed at interrupting Spain's court system that tries terrorist suspects. The discoveries led officials to conclude that their nation had become a crossroads for Muslim extremists. In part because of Spain's proximity to northern Africa. In April 2004, as authorities closed in on the hideout of the suspected Madrid bombing ringleader, a Tunisian man, and his associates, the suspects blew up their apartment. A total of 62 suspects were arrested in 2004 in association with the train bombing. What was the Battle of the Bulge? The term refers to the December 16, 1944, German confrontation with the American forces in the Ardennes Mountains. A forested plateau range that extends from northern France into Belgium and Luxembourg. Even though Germany appeared to be beaten at this late point in the war, Hitler rallied his remaining forces and launched a surprise assault on the American soldiers in Belgium and Luxembourg. 
but Germany could not sustain the front, and within two weeks the Americans had halted the German advance near Belgium's Meuse River, south of Brussels. The offensive became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Because of the protruding shape of the battleground on a map, the Ardennes were also the site of conflict earlier in World War II. In 1940, as well as in World War I, in 1914 and 1918. How was Rome able to conquer Greece? After Alexander the Great died in 323 B. C, his generals divided his empire into successor states, but Greece remained under Macedonian control. Though the Greeks would fight the armies of the Macedonian kings into the 200s BC, they would not achieve independence, and instead associations of Greek city states again fought each other. Meantime, just to the west, Rome had been conquering lands to become a formidable power in the Mediterranean and soon began to look eastward to expand its authority. When Rome conquered Macedonia in 197 BC, Greece was liberated. Fifty years later, in 146 BC, Greece was conquered by Rome and was divided into provinces. While the city-states had no military or political power, they nevertheless flourished under Roman rule. And the Romans, who had first started borrowing from Greek thought and culture around 300 BC, were soon spreading Greek ideas, art, and religion throughout their empire giving rise to the Greco-Roman culture inherited by modern Western civilization. Who were the great thinkers of scholasticism? Just as Islamic philosophers reinterpreted faith by applying reason, subordinating revelation to reason, Western philosophers endeavored to incorporate the doctrines of Greek philosophy into the theology of the Christian Church. Leaders in this movement included St. Augustine. Augustine of Hippo, Saint Anselm, and Saint Thomas Aquinas. Augustine of Hippo, 354-430. Lived during a time when the last vestiges of the pagan world of the Romans was giving way to Christianity. His theological works, including sermons, books, and pastoral letters, reveal a Platonic influence, foreshadowing the movement of scholasticism that emerged more than six centuries later, during the 11th century. Augustine believed that understanding can lead one to faith and that faith can lead a person to understanding. He also argued that Christians can understand the nature of the Trinity by examining their own nature, through introspection. One of Scholasticism's founders, Anselm, c. 1033-1109, was a Benedictine monk who in 1093 became Archbishop of Canterbury. He became famous for writing about the attributes of God, in his work Monologian and for trying to prove the existence of God, in Proslogion, 
by rational means alone. Arguing that God is that of which nothing greater can be thought, that of which nothing greater can be thought must include existence. If it did not, then something greater could be thought, and therefore God necessarily exists. But the greatest figure of scholasticism was St. Thomas Aquinas, 1225-1274, who is also one of the principal saints of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1879 his philosophical works were declared the official Catholic doctrine by Pope Leo XIII, 1810-1903. While he was teaching at universities in Cologne, Germany, and Paris between 1248 and 1272, Thomas Aquinas penned his major works. Summa Contra Gentiles, 1259-64, and Summa Theologica, 1266-73. He discarded the Platonic leanings of St. Augustine, to whom truth was a matter of faith, interpreting Aristotle's naturalistic philosophy. Similar to the Islamic philosopher Avon Nassar, c. 878 to 950, who argued that religion and philosophy are not in conflict with each other. Thomas Aquinas believed faith and reason are in harmony with each other. His work is considered the greatest achievement of medieval philosophy. Making the 13th century scholasticism's golden age. Thomas Aquinas was canonized in 1323 and was proclaimed a doctor of the Catholic Church in 1567. How long did the French Revolution last? The revolution lasted some ten years, and it grew increasingly violent as it progressed. It began in mid-1789 when the government found itself nearly bankrupt, and due to festering discontent among the commoners. The prosperous middle class included, that crisis quickly grew into a movement of reform. The revolution ended in 1799 when French General Napoleon Bonaparte 1769-1821, seized control of the government. Democracy had not been established in France, but the revolution had ended the supreme authority of the king. Had strengthened the middle class and had sent the message across Europe that the tenets of liberty and equality are not to be ignored. How did modern dance begin? American dancer and choreographer Martha Graham 1894 to 1991, is the acknowledged creator of modern dance. She was 35 years old when the Martha Graham Dance Group made its debut on April 14, 1929. Ushering in a new era in dance performance. The new form of dance dissolved the separation between mind and body and relied on technique that was built from within. Graham's interest in dance had begun in her youth. And as an astute observer and manipulator of light and space, she came to be regarded later in life as one of the Masters of the Modernist Movement on a PAR with artist Pablo Picasso, 1881-1973.
she is credited with revolutionizing dance as an art form. In her hands it had become nonlinear and non-representational theater. Choreographing some 180 works in her lifetime, she also taught many students who rose to prominence as accomplished and masterful dancers, including Merce Cunningham and Paul Taylor. When did American poetry begin? As the self-described poet of democracy, Walt Whitman, 1819-1892, was the first to compose a truly American verse one that showed no references to European antecedents. Throwing off both the narrative and ode forms of verse, and that clearly articulated the American experience. His first published poetry was the self published collection Leaves of Grass, 1855. In an effort to gain recognition, Whitman promptly sent a copy to the preeminent man of American letters. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803 to 82, who could count as his acquaintances and friends the great British poets William Wordsworth, 1770 to 1850, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 1772 to 1834, the renowned Scottish essayist Thomas Carlyle, 1795 to 1881 and prominent American writers Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, and Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804-1864. It was a bold move on Whitman's part, but it paid off, while Leaves of Grass had been unfavorably received by reviewers. Emerson composed a five-page tribute. Expressing his enthusiasm for the poetry and remarking that Whitman was at the beginning of a great career. Thoreau, too. Praised the work. More than a century later, biographer Justin Kaplan acclaimed that in its time leaves. Of Grass was the most brilliant and original poetry yet written in the New World. At once the fulfillment of American literary romanticism and the beginnings of American literary modernism. Whitman's well-known and frequently studied poems include Song of Myself. O oh, Captain! My Captain, Song of the Open Road, and I Sing the Body Electric. While she was virtually unknown for her poetry during her lifetime, Emily Dickinson. 1830-1886, was writing at about the same time as Whitman, the 1850s, publishing only a handful of poems before her death. Collections of Dickinson's works were published posthumously, and today she, too, is regarded as one of the great early poets of the United States. Had more of her work been brought out in print, perhaps she would have been recognized as the first truly American poet.